I want to welcome you here today, our members, our guests, our friends, neighbors, and also want to welcome those. We have uh, several hundred people watching online from various countries, amen? Um, from the Philippines and many of the countries as well. So we want to welcome them with us, even though they're far away physically. The title for today's message is Back to Eden, is a series that I've been doing and sharing with you about how God's plan originally was to be in harmony, for us to be in harmony with God. And after the fall in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve ate of the fruit God had forbidden, uh, sin entered into this world. And yet, even though that happened, God had a plan. He is never caught by surprise. Amen? And God had a plan to bring us back into unity, back into harmony with himself. Amen? So I'd like to begin with prayer and invite you to bow your head as I offer these words. Gracious Father in heaven, we, we are gathered here and each one of us has various struggles in life, but alike, Lord, we want to express gratitude to you for life today, for the opportunity that we have to be called Christians. And bless our time in your word, and may our minds and our hearts be open and receptive to your holy voice, the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen. So on Back to Eden, we started in the book of Genesis, and today we're going to spend quite a bit of time in the book of Genesis as well. I want to share with you, if, if this is the first time that you're here, that this is a series that we've been doing, and we greatly appreciate and believe that the Bible is God's inspired word. Can you say amen? amen? And we believe that the Old Testament, as well as the New, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And that you cannot understand the book of Revelation or the New Testament without the Old Testament, and you cannot understand the Old without the New. It is referred to as the Holy Bible, as one complete book. Amen? So we invite you to open your Bible as we study this sacred book that is eternal. God's Word is eternal. I'm just going to give a brief summary because many of you, I'm not sure if you've been here for uh, past uh, studies and back to Eden, but at the very beginning, God created the earth in seven days. We like to think of it in six days, and he created the seventh day, the day of rest on the seventh, and God blessed the day. And then what happened is he had created Adam and Eve to be his companions, and he had given them instructions not to eat from the tree in the garden, in the midst of the garden, or the middle of the garden. It was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God was protecting them from a knowledge of what? Evil. From evil, yes. They had been in the presence of God. They walked with Jesus day by day in the garden. They were not afraid of God, and they were not against God. They were not in rebellion against God. You see, Jesus came to this earth to bring us back into harmony so that we are no longer afraid of God. Amen? That we are brought into harmony, not only in our practices and what we do, but also in the way we think and what we believe about God and ourselves. If you'd like to turn with me in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I'm just very briefly going to summarize this verse. We had a whole message about this. And this verse is the first prophecy that I can find in the Bible. And if you understand this verse, all of Scripture, all the New Testament is going to open up wide to your understanding of what's happening behind the scenes. We are living in a warfare. There's a war taking place. And no, I'm not referring to what's happening in Ukraine or some other place here on the planet. But I'm speaking of the whole planet as a whole. There's a great warfare taking place over who is your Lord, who is your master. And you have two rivals. You have Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, and you have Satan or the devil, as the Bible refers to him. And they are enemies. You have the one who is the arch enemy of Jesus, and you have Jesus who is the king of righteousness. Can you say amen? 
Now, here after Adam and Eve had sinned, I want you to understand that their whole nature changed from within. And so we have a society today that, that teaches people to look inward, that you're good on the inside and you can do more and all these kinds of things. And in fact, the Bible teaches us that the heart is sick who can know it. And it's full of putrefying sores, uh, the Holy Spirit writes through the prophets. And so what we have here is we have Jesus stepping in, so to speak, in which he makes this declaration. He says, I will put enmity, verse 15 of Genesis 3, I will put hatred between you, Satan, and my people, the woman. The Bible often refers to God's people as his bride or his woman, his people. And between your offspring, your followers, or in the King James Version, your seed, and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So here the seed, or as refers to in the King James, as it shall bruise thy head. That's referring to Jesus Christ, as we've studied. Jesus is the seed. He is the one in the Garden of Eden at this time, and he is making a proclamation and a promise that he's going to come and he's going to deliver his people from the power of sin and the power of Satan. Amen? Praise God. And so what happens here is, as you look through all the stories of the Old Testament down to the New, you'll understand that there's a, a, a struggle going on because Jesus foretold that he would come as a child, as a human being, God with us, Emmanuel, and he would deliver us from sin. The problem is sin, amen? And he would demonstrate what God the Father's character is really like. What is heaven all about? And so what you have is you have Satan who is trying to prevent Jesus from coming. And so in Genesis chapter 4, just after, we don't know the time frame. The Bible doesn't give us 100 years perhaps, several hundred years, we don't know. But Adam and Eve, uh, Adam knew his wife Eve, chapter 4, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And then, of course, Abel was born as well. And you, what you have is you have a, two rivals. You have Cain who rises up and kills his brother Abel. And it wasn't because Cain had a bad day. It was because Cain was listening to a different voice. He was listening to the same voice that Eve listened to in the garden when she ate of the fruit. And so for you and I to be prepared for Jesus' second coming, God wants to Teach us how to listen to his voice, to recognize his voice, and to obey his voice. Amen? Amen? So we have studied, as you look at Cain and Abel, Cain rises up to kill his brother Abel. And then we studied about the flood. As you look at through all the, the struggles through history of Old Testament, you have uh, David and Goliath, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau. You have these struggles, even within families, rivals between those who follow God and those who do not. And then we come to about, we discovered about 1,500 years to 2,000. We don't know exactly, but scholars estimate between that many years after creation because we don't know exactly the year of creation. But we find that God came to the point where he decided that he repented in creating mankind, men and women. They had become so evil, there was violence over all the earth among God's creation, the animals, among people. And it had become so wicked that even the Bible says that even their thoughts were continually evil. They weren't even thinking in terms of good thoughts toward others or toward God. So it's amazing to me to really think about that God came to the point, a merciful and loving creator came to the point where he says, I must destroy what I have created because it has been so infected with sin that they will destroy themselves. Amen? Now, we have the flood. You're familiar with the story of Noah. Remember in Sunday school and Sabbath school where you learned about the flood and Noah, and he built the ark, the ship, and how many people were saved? Eight. Only eight. And remember we studied there could have been millions of people because they lived to be almost 1,000 years old. So they had children during that time of that 900 years or more that they were living. And so the earth was populated. It was, could have been millions of people, but God, only eight people got into the ark, and everyone had an opportunity to get in. Now, verse, chapter 9 and verse 1, it says here, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and what? Multiply 
and replenish the earth. They were to fill the earth. The earth was to be filled with God's people that reflect his character, who love him, whom he loves as well. You see, after the flood, God intended that the descendants of Noah, uh, Ham Sh and uh, Japheth, Shem and ha Japheth, thank you, that he would scatter their children abroad, he would fill the earth and repopulate the earth, and they would uh, reflect his image. It was not God's plan that the people of the earth would consolidate together in one place or in large cities. That was not God's plan. And that would be a recipe for rebellion. And that's what we see in our society today. Now, turn with me in your Bible to Genesis chapter 10. Let's go to the next chapter. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod. So Cush was a person, that's his name. He had a son, and his name was Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said about him, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now here, Nimrod was the one who initiated the building of the Tower of Babel. This is what we're coming to. Now we're going to look at the call of Abraham to come out of Babylon. So Nimrod means rebellion. When you look at names in the Bible, they have great significance. People at that time didn't name their children because they liked the sound of the words or the name. Like my name is David, so my parents liked the name David. But in biblical times, the name that was given to a child had something to do with his character, had something to do about the person, or it was even prophetic in many ways. So the word Nimrod, the name Nimrod, Nimrod, means rebellion. And in later Babylonian tradition, Nimrod married Cinnaramis. How many of you are familiar with uh, ancient pagan culture or some things as you study the Bible? Uh, Nimrod married Cinnaramis, and when they both died, Nimrod became the sun god, which many people worship today, and Cinnaramis became the moon goddess. And thus, the people of Babel, the Tower of Babel, were idolatrous people. Now, the kingdom of Babylon, as we study it, was located on the banks of the river Euphrates in Mesopotamia. And go with me to Genesis chapter 11, just giving you a history after the fall of Adam and Eve. Then we have some 2,000 years or so, we have the flood. God had come to the point where he had to destroy the earth. Now, shortly after that, we have the Tower of Babel. This was 100 years after the flood. And notice what people are doing when they consolidate together after the flood. They have this history of what happened, how God had destroyed the earth. They have the testimony of Noah. And 100 years after the flood, they come together and they build a tower for themselves in defiance of God. What did God tell the people to do? He had told them to scatter abroad. And now what happens is they're co coming together and they're in rebellion together against God. Now go with me to Genesis chapter 11 and verse 1. And the whole earth was of one what? Language. And of one speech. That means they're of one mind. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east or rightly interpreted this should be they traveled toward the east as they journeyed they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there so they built a city there something else we should notice and you'll notice I will be mentioning this later in the message and that is is they're of one language and they're of one speech or of one mind as we look at prophecy in the end times Satan is going to lead people to have the same experience in which they're going to be in rebellion against God and they're going to have one mind of being in re rebellion against God. But we know that God is going to overrule the plans of mankind. Amen? So they're traveling toward the east. Now, the entire human race at this time, for 100 years after the flood, had one language and were of one mind. Now, 
Not only did they literally speak the same language, but they were also of the same page, on the same page with each other. And history has shown that a common language among people promotes national unity, thought, and action. So the builders of the Tower and Babel were cemented by their common language and their rebellious spirit. And this rebellious spirit was originally where? In heaven with the fall of Lucifer and on earth in leading Eve and Adam to rebel against God. So for 100 years after the flood, it was Satan's plan through this process, his hidden agenda, that he was going to demoralize the people of God to the point to where he would try to prevent the Messiah from coming. Remember Genesis 3.15. So Jesus had promised that he was going to come. And now he led all these people, millions of people, to rebel against God to the point to where God destroyed the world with a flood. And now you have just a few people, eight people, of which all of us are descendants from. And so then, shortly after there, a hundred years after the flood, after hearing the stories, they build a tower to make a name for themselves in defiance of God, to scatter abroad. And they're building a tower because they, they're not, they choose not to believe God where God put his bow in the cloud and he promised us what? that he would never flood the earth again with water. So it's in direct opposition to God, a disbelief of God's word. Let's continue to read as we go through this chapter. In verse 3 it says, And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower. What did God tell the people to do? to scatter abroad. So this is called rebellion, isn't it? It's doing the opposite of what God said. Go to, let us build us a city and a tower. Who are they going to build it for? Are they building it for God? No. They're building it for themselves. Do we see that happening today? Have you ever seen some of the pictures and videos of things of around the world, these, these massive cities, some of them being built in the desert, massive skyscrapers and things? It's it, like, I liken that to this time in the Bible. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name. Let us be, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So they decided to build a city and a tower so that they would not be scattered abroad as God commanded, you see. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. Now, Notice this with Nimrod, whose name is Rebellion. I want to read a quote, a historical quote to you that has some bearing on this. God had directed men to disperse throughout the earth, to replenish and subdue it. But these Babel builders determined to keep their community united in one body and to found a monarchy that should eventually embrace the whole earth. Do we see something like that happening today? Is there a, per, uh, a movement to bring about a new world order? Yes. What's the common language? English. Is there a purpose, a desire to bring about a common currency? There have been many attempts at this. You see, mankind, on the inspiration of Satan, is trying to bring about a one world form of government in rebellion against God, you see. Let me finish the quote here. Thus, their city would become the metropolis of a universal empire. Its glory would command the admiration and homage of the world and render the founders illustrious. The magnificent tower reaching to the heavens was intended to stand as a monument of the power and wisdom of its builders, perpetuating their fame to the la latest generations. So they are in opposition against God. They're working against God and leading the people in rebellion against God himself. Amen? First of all, the tower was to reach a very high, lofty height so that they could explain the reason why there was a flood. 
because they disbelieved the testimony of Noah and God. Secondly, they hoped to build a tower tall enough so that they could escape if there was another flood. And yet God had promised, when you see the bow in the cloud today, we should remember God's promise. He's not going to flood the earth again. Amen. It means we can trust God's promises. So the Babel, Babel means confusion, by the way. The builders, so Nimrod means rebellion. Babel means confusion. So you have rebellion and confusion working together in opposition to God. No, so the Babel builders, they harbor the same spirit as Satan. They harbor the same spirit of Cain, the same spirit of those who refused to get into the ark in the time of Noah. So they were making a name for themselves. They wanted to be renowned individuals. They wanted to be respected among the people of the earth. They wanted to control the earth. And they were famous, if you will, and notorious for their wickedness. Now, it's interesting that after 1,500 years after the Tower of Babel, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, tries to rebuild Babylon. You see how history repeats itself? It's this rebellion against God. It's, it's, a, it's a purpose of building a one-world government. So what we have today is not new. This is something that mankind, Satan, has been inspiring people for many years. But thankfully, we have a God who sees everything. Amen? One who is love. We don't have to worry because God is always with his people. Can you say amen? And so Nebuchadnezzar patterned his kingdom after Nimrod's kingdom in his tower in Babel. He tried to control the world, and it was a worldwide empire, if you read Daniel chapter 2. So what did the Lord do? Let's go to verse 5. God is receiving testimony and records from the angels who come to the earth, and then he comes down himself personally, and he sees this report. He wants to see exactly what are they doing. And in verse 5, it says, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. Now, I want to express to you that the sons of men are the opposite of the sons of God. The sons of God are those who follow God. And so when it was referring to the sons of men, if you study it carefully, you'll find it's those who are in rebellion against God. That's why it refers to also the daughters of men, because later if we study the flood, part of the reason is because the sons of God married the daughters of men, right? And then Satan was leading them to do this, to compromise in such a way so that he could prevent the Messiah from coming. He's trying to prevent the Messiah from arriving through the holy line, the lineage, the holy lineage. Now, verse 6 is very interesting. Notice what happens here. And the Lord said, Behold, or take notice, the people is what? They are one. And they all have one what? A language. And this they begin to do. So they have one language. They have one mind. We're going to get back to this expression of one mind because in Revelation, we're going to find that Satan's going to lead people into a confederacy to be of one mind in rebellion against God. And that's when we ref the Bible refers to the mark of the beast, who take and receive the mark of the beast. Amen? So this history repeats itself. We're living at the end of time, and so we're reading through history how this has happened before. And we know who wins. Amen? We know who wins. And so here it says, Jesus declares... God declares here, and they all have one language. This people is one. They have one purpose. And this they begin to do. Notice it says this is how they begin. It will not end. It always leads further rebellion against God and wickedness. Amen. And now he says here, and now nothing, verse 6, and now nothing will be what? Restrained from them which they have imagined to do in their mind. So what's going to happen in the end of time is that God is going to remove the restraint from people. The angels are going to withhold the four winds. They're going to let go, excuse me, of the four winds of strife, and Satan's going to have control in the, in the end of time. So right now what we're seeing is really uh, a letting go. You see this rioting. You have this attitude and this rebellion against law and order. Uh, forget political parties, just in general, the, the disrespect 
against authority and against law and order, amen? And so we see that Satan is working and there's a, con- a plan as we see happening where he's bringing everyone into one mind and for one purpose in rebellion against God. But God is faithful, amen? He's seen it before, he's worked with these people before, and God will come to our rescue, amen? It's very important as we go through it says, God says, behold, the people is one. They are working together, and they have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing will be restrained from them. And that's when he comes down, verse 7, go to, let us, the Godhead, the angels, let us go down and there do what? Confuse their languages, their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So you can imagine they're building this tower with massive stones and someone at the top says, bring me some brick. And someone brings up mortar or sticks because they're speaking different languages all of a sudden. You have French, you have German. uh, All the languages of the earth have their root from the Tower of Babel, you see. And so here we have rebellion against God. God came down and confound their languages. And what happens if you have multiple languages? What happens to the gospel? It becomes more difficult to spread the good news because there's various languages. But when we read in Revelation, we're going to find that the gospel is going to go out to every nation, to every language, and every kind of people. You know what happened in, at Pentecost? The opposite happened. God solved the problem. They were of one accord, and they spoke different languages, but the Holy Spirit was poured out, and what happened to the disciples? They spoke in tongues, which means, literally, they spoke the language in which the people needed to hear. It's not gibberish. It's not something you can't understand. They were given the gift by the Holy Spirit to speak the good news of Jesus Christ as Messiah to those who would understand in different languages of the earth. You see, and so they might speak in Hebrew or Aramaic and then a Greek would understand in Greek what he was saying because the Holy Spirit is able to translate, amen, the language because the Holy Spirit, the God came down and confounded their languages, confused their languages. So the confounding of the languages at Babel was actually a blessing with a multinational, multilingual, and multicultural world, a global consolidated apostasy, which was much more difficult. But you see what's happening in our world today? They're trying to bring it back together under control, you see. On the other hand, God solved this problem as far as the gospel going out by pouring out his spirit And on the day of Pentecost, everyone heard the good news of the Messiah, which Jesus had promised he would come. So here we have Babel is the word for confusion. But here's what's interesting about the Tower of Babel as well. All the nations of the world came into existence as a result of the scattering of the Babel builders And thus, their false religion was propagated throughout the whole world as they scattered and and grouped together by language. And so the nations were divided after the flood. And so here we find that they would come together. All the nations of the world would come into existence as a result of the scattering of the Babel builders. And so their false religion would also be scattered abroad Take, for instance, an example. The rosary is used equally by Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, and Roman Catholics, and some others as well. This is a religious practice that is not based on Scripture in the various religious traditions that have a a common history or a common ancestor. And it goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel. Now, God calls us out of confusion. Amen? Amen. That's why we read and study God's Word. Amen? It brings clarity to our thoughts of our existence, our purpose, and God's character. Can you say amen? So God called Abraham about... We have the flood, which is about 2,000 years after creation. 
give or take several hundred years. And then after the flood, a hundred years later, we had the Tower of Babel. And then after that, a hundred years or 200 years after the Tower of Babel, God comes down and destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. It becomes so wicked, he destroys even the cities. 300 years after the tower, we have the call of Abraham out of Babylon. So let's take a look at Abraham. Abraham lived in the region where the Tower of Babel was built. The word Mesopotamia means the land between the rivers. That's the river Tigris and the river Euphrates. And the river Euphrates is spoken of in the book of Revelation in regards to prophecy. Daniel 2 makes very clear that the Chaldeans of the Babylonians in that area that were working together were from the kingdom of Babylon. The call of Abraham took place approximately 300 years after the Tower of Babel experience. Now notice with me, Abraham's family was being defiled by idolatry. We notice that in the story of Lot. Remember Lot and what happened with Noah and his children, how they were affected by the culture in which they lived. Now notice with me in Joshua 24, verse 3. Let's go there together in your Bibles, the book of Joshua, just before the book of Judges, Joshua chapter 24, and look with me at verse 3. Verse 2 says, And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, or the river, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other what? Other gods. They were idolaters. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed, his offspring, and gave him Isaac. So here we have God calls Abraham from his country, his familiar place, because he was being affected by the idolatry and the sin of the area. We noticed this with Lot. We noticed it with Noah and others. So God has a call for him to come out, and God is calling him to the land of Canaan. And you might ask the question, why? Why Canaan? All of this has to do with the promise of Genesis 3.15. Because God has promised that the Messiah would appear, that God would become mankind. He would become flesh, and he would walk and live among us. And so here we find that it is a prophecy of the Messiah that he is coming and he wants his people to be prepared when he does come. Amen. The future Messiah would be born in Canaan and the Holy Spirit would be poured out there as the gospel message would go to the whole world, the entire world. Now in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1 through 3, let's go back to Genesis which was our scripture reading, Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. It is comforting to know that God knows your experience. He knows my experience, and God calls each one of us to serve him. Amen? We may serve him in various ways, but alike we can serve him. And God is preparing a people here in these last days who will also get into the ark. He is calling people to come out of the cities, like he called Lot, to be close to him, you see. God is calling us so that we can get rid of sin. We can understand God's character and we can learn to trust him. Because there's going to come a time where this, this wickedness is going to consolidate. We can see it happening. And there's going to be a point in which there's going to be a great battle between Christ and Satan here on this earth just before Jesus returns. And Jesus wants you and your family prepared and loyal to him, amen, as he is loyal to you. He has promised us he will never leave us nor forsake us. And may God bless us with the determination and a heart that we will never leave him nor forsake him. Amen. In Genesis 12, verse 1 and through 3, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get you out of your country 
and from your kindred, your people, your relatives, and from your father's house, and unto a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, Abraham, and will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you, and curse him that curses you. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed." You see, God had called Abraham out because he had promised that he was going to come as the Messiah. He wanted the holy line to be preserved so that the Messiah could come. He, it was God's plan to locate the children of Israel through Abraham in the land of Canaan, which was a hub of three continents, Asia, Europe, and Africa. So that when the people came to trade in goods and wares and all the things the Bible mentions, you know, the things that we use, the wood and the food and everything else, they would come to the land of Canaan, to the land of Israel, and they would hear about the Messiah. That was God's purpose for Israel. That's why they were chosen to declare the Messiah, the Son of God, and they failed. So let us not fail in our calling as Christians, amen? to appoint people to the great Messiah, to Jesus Christ. God's great plan was that the gospel, the good news of salvation, would be shared with everyone who came into contact with the people of God in Israel, as they would come and trade their goods and their food and everything else. God was preparing the way for the Messiah so the people would receive him, they would recognize him, and so we have this struggle between Christ and Satan, and Satan knows that if the Messiah appears, and if he comes and he's not infected with sin, he will lose his kingdom. Amen? And so he is trying to work through men and women to prevent Jesus from coming and to try to infect him with sin. Now, I'd like you to turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. Let's go to the Gospel. This is another illustration of how we cannot understand the Old Testament without the New. Jesus walks on the earth, God in the flesh. He becomes as one of us. And in John chapter 8, verse 56, Jesus makes this declaration about Abraham and about himself. He's in a conversation with the Jews, and he says in verse 56, he says, Your father Abraham, who they trusted it, it, because they were the seed of Abraham, the lineage of Abraham that they were saved, and the favored of God, but Jesus had a different story to tell them. He says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he what? He saw it. What did he see? What did Abraham, what was Abraham shown in vision? the day that the Messiah would appear, the promise of Genesis 3.15. You see? Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be there when Jesus was born, to talk to the shepherds, to talk to the wise men who came from the east, and to bow before the child who is the king of the universe? He said, and he saw it, and he was what? He was glad. He was glad to see Jesus, the Messiah. He had faith that what God said he would do. You see, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon you and I, the Gentiles, in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, as Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. I'd like to, you to turn in your Bible with me to the book of Acts, chapter 1. The book of Acts, chapter 1, as we pull all this together. You have this great struggle. There's various languages of the world, and you have a common language for business, so to speak, in English. There's a movement to bring about a new world order. A new world order, mind you, in rebellion against God, who's going to bring about the mark of the beast and try to get everyone to worship them or the Antichrist power instead of worshiping the Christ, Jesus Christ. 
And all along, God had foretold this in the book of Revelation. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that people would gather together in rebellion and that he was working through history, through all these different people like Noah and Lot. He was working through Abraham and King David and others to bring about the promised seed that would come in which we would all be delivered from the power of sin. Wouldn't it be wonderful, instead of repeating sin, that we could have be broken, the power of sin would be broken and we can be set free. Amen? And so in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it says this, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in the land of Samaria and unto the uttermost part of what? Of the earth. You see, there was the barrier, if you will, of different languages. But the gospel had been predicted it would go out to the whole world before Jesus came, where he would come back. Now look with me in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. This is the day of Pentecost. Notice how God, God's plan will not be subverted. God's plan will be carried out. To you and I, if we're not very knowledgeable of the Bible, we would see things happening and we think, where is God? How is God working? The wicked are prospering. The wicked are persecuting the Christians. They're persecuting those who are faithful to God. But nothing surprises God. He sees the end from the beginning. He inhabits eternity. He is the I am of the burning bush. Amen. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, here's an illustration of the power of God to overcome great difficulties so that the gospel can reach the hearts of people. And may it reach our hearts this morning. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all of one accord. There's that one mind again. In one place. God had brought the disciples in one thought of humility and trust in God. The glory goes to Jesus. Amen? And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, or languages, like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other what? Other languages, or tongues, as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance, or that gift, that ability. And verse 5, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. There's that expression again, every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, confused, because that every man heard them speak in his own what? His own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own language wherein we were born? We are hearing what they are saying. We are understanding what they are saying. It goes on to say Parthians, Medes, remember the Medo-Persian Empire, and it says the dwellers of Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, and it goes on to mention many others, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, verse 11, we do hear them speak in our language or tongues the wonderful what? Works of God, you see. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what does this mean? Amen? So they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. They're all hearing the gospel, the good news. And the good news is Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus has come to deliver us from sin. Amen? So the confusion of the languages at Babel made the preaching of the gospel more difficult. But on the day of Pentecost, God solved this problem. Amen? There's no problem too great for Jesus Christ. And in this way, the blessing of Abraham that God had promised could go into the whole world. And Jesus is that blessing. Remember in Genesis 11:7, 7, it said, Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So now turn with me to Revelation chapter 17. 
We're going to go forward to Revelation 17 to prophecy, how this relates to prophecy. You see, as we understand the Old Testament and the history of mankind and God's dealing with sin and sinners and his people, we will understand what is going to happen in the near future. In Revelation chapter 17, a John has been given vision and an angel appears to him and shares with him these things. And he writes what he sees and what he hears. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, which is one of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come here, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great what? Whore that sits upon many what? Waters. What do the waters represent? Go to verse 15. Look at verse 15. The angel explains it to him. And he said unto me, The waters which you saw, referring to the vision he gave to John, where the whore sits, this is an apostate woman, or a church, if you will, that's an apostate against God, are peoples and multitudes and nations and what? And languages or tongues, yes. So here we have, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. They've been made drunk, in a sense, with her teachings, her false doctrines. Verse 3, so he carried me away, the angel did, in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit on a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having the seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed, or dressed, in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of these abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now verse 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mysterious or mystery, what? Great confusion, Babylon the Great. She is the seat of great confusion. Remember, what, was, what does the word Nimrod mean? Rebellion. Rebellion. And Babel means confusion, right? So we have this consolidation under the Antichrist power here. It's called mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, so she has daughters. So it's a church who claims to be the mother church, but she also has harlots and abominations of the earth. So here we have a consolidation of evil in the end of time where they're going to use, bring every nation together and confuse people about what is truth. Now go with me to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14. And then we're going to go back to Revelation 17. In Revelation 14, verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell where? On the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue or language and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, not to ourselves and what we build. And for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there appeared another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is what? Fallen. Now in the Bible, if you study it carefully, when the Bible repeats an expression like this, it means that it is established, it will take place. It's not just a, pro a conditional prophecy. And so here, Babylon will fall. Confusion will fall. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of her fornication. And verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. But John has shown something else in verse 12. Here is the patience of whom? Of the saints. Here are they that do what? They keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Amen? So this is the great powers that be on earth bringing rebellion together as we see it transpiring but God has his way Revelation 17 verse 12 it says here as we look at another chapter Revelation 17 verse 12 and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings this is the angel describing to John what he saw in vision 
which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beasts, the Antichrist power. These have one what? Mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beasts. These shall make war with the lamb. Who's the lamb? It's Jesus. And the lamb shall what? Overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen, and what else? Faithful. Faithful. Amen? You know, if you go with me to Revelation 18 as well, there are angels that John sees who cry mightily, who proclaim that Babylon is fallen. And if you look at me at verse 4, it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, what? My people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. So God calls us out as he called Abraham out. He calls us out of confusion because he wants you to be a blessing to the rest of the world. And that blessing is when we receive Jesus Christ and he controls our lives. He is a blessing in us to others. Amen? Jesus is coming soon. And he wants you in his kingdom. He has called us out of confusion. He has called us to obey his word. Amen? To live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Amen? And he will make you a blessing to others. How many of you want to be ready when Jesus comes? Amen? You want to be ready when he comes? He's coming soon. And as we look at what's happening around us, the winds, of, the winds are being let go in which the four angels are holding back the strife. And as sometimes it, it seems like it's being let go and you see all these riots taking place. It's showing up here and it's showing up there. These are signs to us that someone is coming, that we're even at the door. Now, today is the day of salvation, friends. Today is the day to let go of sin and say, Jesus, is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything that you want me to surrender to you? Lord, I want to overcome. I give myself to you. And that's what Abraham did. Abraham left his country. He went to the land of Canaan. He had not seen. He obeyed God's voice. He put his trust in the great creator. And God blessed him. And you and I are blessed because of Abraham's faithfulness. Because through him, Jesus was born. And may he be born in our hearts today. Amen? Let's pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, thank you for the testimony of your word and the testimony of prophets and people, men and women you've used in the past to circumvent evil and rebellion. And so, Father, we pray that you will take rebellion from our hearts in whatever form it may take so that we are in harmony with you so that when you speak to us, we will say, here am I, like Isaiah and like Abraham, who is willing to go to the ends of the earth to be with you and to walk with you. So bless this congregation and everyone listening that we may recognize your voice. And in Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen.